Hi, folks. Can everybody hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Fabulous. Um, yes. Welcome. Welcome. I'm Aaron Dorfman, founder and executive director of A More Perfect Union, the Jewish Partnership for Democracy, and a longtime friend of JCPA. I'm honored to be moderating this panel and particularly thrilled to be learning with and from our extraordinary panelists, whom I'll introduce in a moment. It's almost a cliche to describe the upcoming election, really any upcoming election, as the most consequential in recent history, so I won't bother doing that. I do think, however, that it's important to acknowledge some of the context in which this election will be contested. It will be the first election after 2020's extraordinary experiment in conducting an election in the midst of a global pandemic. It will be the first election since the January 6th uprising and the emergence of a durable big lie and stop the steel movement in this country. It will be the first election since a spate of new laws restricting voting have gone into effect in state legislatures around the country. These are high stakes issues for America and they're particularly high stakes issues for us as American Jews. The Jewish life we've built in this country is more vibrant, diverse, and robust than that which we've built in any diasporic context in the last 2,000 years. And I'd argue that our ability to build that life is primarily a function of the robustness of American democracy, which provides the container in which all of American Jewish life across all political, ideological, and denominational lines thrives. Elections are far from the sum total of democracy, but ensuring that they are free and fair is a necessary precondition for everything else. So these are nearly existential issues for us. Like I said, I'm thrilled to be uh, to have our, our amazing um, panelists with us. You'll find detailed bios for each of them, uh, for each of our speakers in the chat. So I'll just share here their organizational affiliations and a brief word about the topic on which they'll be speaking. Elise Workus is legislative director for issue one. She'll be speaking about the state of election administration around the country, federal election funding and protection of election officials. Rachel Brown is founder and executive director of Project Over Zero. She'll be speaking about risks of election related political violence. Dominic Whitehead is vice president of campaigns for the NAACP and he'll be speaking about the specific challenges that the NAACP is tackling this cycle. Charlie Bronner is communications director from Move Texas. He'll be speaking about Texas's new voting restrictions and what they mean on the ground. I'm going to ask each panelist to provide the background challenges and current state of play for each of their topics. I'll ask them to keep those remarks to a maximum of about five minutes. And then I'll ask each of them a specific question related to their comments and, uh, and then maybe a, an overarching question before we turn it over to you, uh, our, our audience and participants, to, to um, send questions our way. Please drop questions into the chat um, and we'll aggregate them and uh, queue them up uh, after the panelists have had a chance to speak. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to uh, I'm going to turn things over to Elise. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Aaron, for pulling us all together. And I too am just really excited to hear from my fellow panelists too and learn a little bit more about things that I don't directly work on. But um, I had a chance to listen to Governor Whitmer's. Um, sorry. Todd Whitman, not Governor Whitmer, another governor in the news, her comments um, earlier in the in the previous session. And I think it's um, a lot of what she said is a lot of what I will be covering too, but it's just a really good kind of appetizer to this discussion here today. Um, I, like Aaron said, I'm the legislative director for issue one. We are uh, a federal reform organization working in a very cross-partisan way, trying to figure out how to protect elections, how to um, improve the functioning of Congress, how to ensure um, ethics, say in campaign finance transparency in Congress, and have really uh, put a lot of time and energy into election protection in the last three to four years based on what we've been seeing in this country. And um, the three kind of biggest threats I see to our elections and election administration at this point, um, and we should all be concerned about this, is the, the, the exodus of election officials from um, their positions at the local and state level. They're um, on the receiving end of an unprecedented wave of threats and threats of violence and harassment to them and their families, which we've never seen before in this country. Um, and I think a lot of people need to understand that our election officials are, you know, the coach of the little league team, our neighbor, the person we volunteer, you know, on the PTA with. 
um, and are not, and most of them are, are subject to election every two, four, six years at, at the local level. And um, while the Department of Justice and um, has taken some action on, on these threats to election officials, we're still seeing over 50% of them planning to retire in the next two years, um, which, is, which is really concerning just because of how the environment has kind of declined for them. Um, there's also been um, an influx and governor, um, the governor touched on this, but an influx of very hyper-partisan anti-democracy candidates running for election official positions at the state, state and local level. Um, States United Action recently did a report um, where they found that two of the three contests for governor and secretary of state this year include anti-democracy candidates or candidates who are denying the outcome of the 2020 presidential election, which we've also never seen in this country. Um, and if these folks win, you know, they will have a direct ability to potentially meddle or intervene in state, you know, election administration procedures in, in um, this fall or in 2024 when we're going to have another presidential election. Um, and some legislatures have also passed laws that put election administration positions, um, decisions rather, in the hands of, of very partisan actors when previously a lot of these were done in very nonpartisan positions or, or conducted by co-partisans by both parties. Um, and, and the third biggest threat that I, I would like to just talk about today is how our elections are not viewed as critical infrastructure right now, and they are chronically underfunded. Um, and we need to just think about that for a second. If, if we say that elections are the cornerstone or, of democracy and democracy is a precondition for everything that's good in this country, um, we should begin to think about elections as if they're highways and hospitals and they need regular federal funding. They cannot all be done based on um, in a lot of these municipalities at the very, very local level. They do need federal support and um, we need to understand that by doing that, we actually are meeting a lot of like cross-person objectives, improving cybersecurity, improving things like automatic voter registration, expanding early voting, all these things cost money. Um, so I look forward to talking um, about these, these emerging um, challenges with all of you today, but thanks for having me. Thanks very much, Elise. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Rachel Brown from Project Over Zero. Thank you so much. I will just echo that um, I'm really grateful to be able to be here today and with my fellow panelists and with Aaron as moderator and with everyone um, who is part of this convening. Um, I thought I would use this time to provide some broad framing of how we understand political violence and risks of political violence. So I actually want to start us with a definition. Um, Again, I'm executive director of Over Zero. We work on preventing and building resilience to political violence. And I found often here, um, my, my background is doing this work internationally, as is most of uh, my teams on election violence prevention, atrocity prevention. And I find often here when you say violence prevention, people's minds go to what do you do after an attack? Um, but we really think about a much broader set of work that, that undermines um, a permissive environment for violence that, that makes violence less possible, less permissible, um, and that addresses its impacts. So the definition that we use for political violence is violence that is aimed at political ends. It aims to control or change who benefits from and who participates fully in political, economic, and sociocultural life. So with this definition, I wanna point out two things. One is that the impact of this violence is beyond its immediate victims. Its ultimate impact is society. It's meant to have a controlling impact, again, a signaling impact, a coercive impact on how our democracy functions, on how our society functions. In this definition, threat and intimidation count as violence. They are the use of the threat of violence as a coercive tool to, towards these same ends. So it's not just a physical attack. It does include what Elise was just talking about, right? This heavy increase in intimidation, threats, and harassment geared towards public officials. By this definition, it also includes hate violence, violence targeting specific groups, this violence that is meant to signal, to control, to make certain groups of people feel like they cannot be safe participating in their everyday life, participating in political life, participating in their, in their cultural life, in their religious life. Um, 
And, and elections are often a very known flashpoint for violence. They're contentious winner takes all events, especially uh, the way that they're structured here in the US and they have to do with who holds power. So one way that we often think about elections in election violence prevention work internationally is that elections themselves serve as a conflict resolution mechanism. They're a system and a structure for people to essentially have conflict, but within a set of institutions and systems. So when people stop trusting that process, being willing to use that process, start using violence to manipulate that process, right, we might expect to see, see violence. So elections tend to be a known flashpoint for political violence, but they're not the only uh, type of political violence. And around elections, um, most violence that we tend to see, if you just look globally at election violence writ large, most violence happens before and after election day. It's that pre-election period where often violence, threats, intimidation, and harassment are used to shape who feels like they can show up to vote or shape how people will vote. Um, and you can think back to 2020, we saw that, that sort of voter intimidation, fear, and the, the sort of threats in the lead up to election day not a lot of necessarily violence on election day. And then in the after election period, we see violence used to contest results. Um, and of course we saw this in the US with January 6th. So I just wanna make a couple of quick points about where we are right now. The first is that we're already in a climate of increased political violence. I won't speak again to the violence targeting election administrators um, and the threats targeting election administrators that Elise spoke to. We've obviously also seen governors and mayors targeted. Um, we've seen um, public health workers targeted. So you are seeing the targeting of people who hold public positions that run our democratic processes or serve core functions. Um, and again, you can see in, a, in what Elise was just speaking to with the resignation that even without physical violence happening, that threats, the intimidation, that climate has an impact on who's feeling like they can participate, perform a civic duty, play a particular role. And those threats, um, now we see disproportionate targeting of um, rep Republicans who have not um, gone um, along with the a stolen election narrative, but we also see disproportionate targeting of, of minority communities of women. We also face a number of risk factors for political violence, including false and harmful narratives. Um, we've, um, oh, and I should say, we've, we've seen that increase in political violence over time. We saw rise in hate violence prior to the election. Um, so, so we see a lot of the underlying risk factors for election related violence, the mis and disinformation, the narratives of elections um, being stolen that start even before an election cycle. Um, and, and what we're seeing now, I would argue, is that there are really state-specific dynamics playing out. So we need to understand the risk of political violence at the state level and be able to mount responses at the state level. And the last thing I'll say, and I think we'll get into this more in the Q&A, is that one thing that political violence tries to do is take away our sense of agency. Um, and you see this in how it gets talked about. Violence is happening. It's erupting. It's like it's a natural disaster that we don't have control over. And that's not the case. It's not something that's just happening. It's something that's being done, it's something that's being done strategically. And we do have agency to do something about it. So um, in talking about risks, I always like to make that point, And I think we'll get to dig into that more together later. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, Dominic, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Aaron, and good afternoon, everyone. Again, Dominic Whitehead, Vice President of Campaigns here um, at the NAACP, and excited to be here. Um, for us this year and our team out of the campaigns overall, there's three things that we're literally focusing in on um, when it comes to um, electoral, enga electoral engagement, um, and or mobilization and organizing. One, it is no secret voting rights is the biggest issue. It connects back to both what Rachel and Elise was just mentioning a, a second ago. When um, we think about um, violence that we're seeing at the polls or our election administrators that are happening um, in many states across the country. Um, we've seen the attack on voting rights across the country over the last two years. We do know it has been a direct attack to communities of color um, due to the 2020 election cycle, and most importantly, due to the Georgia runoffs um, in January of 2021. Um, so what does federal voting rights look like? Um, because states are being attacked day in and day out in their state legislatures, um, and or we take states like Michigan, for instance, where we have a great governor, um, G Governor Gretchen Whitmore, who's been able to veto, um, however, the Republican Party was able to put or trying to put um, voting rights reforms or restrictions on um, ballot measures. So what does that look like in 2022 and 2024? 
Um, the second piece is what we're all here right now having this conversation, coalition building. And what does that mean in terms of driving up voter engagement, driving up voter education around many of the new laws and many of the states that we've had gains around voter, excuse me, around voter voting rights that are beginning to be rolled back. So what does coalition building look like in terms of working together and partner engagement? And the third and the final piece, I think, um, that I would love to talk about, and I'll dive into that piece a little later during the panel discussion and Q&A, uh, is the messaging and the narrative, right? Um, there's a message out there that voters are tired, um, people are tired of volunteering, we we changed the world in 2020, um, but yet we still don't have voting rights, yet we still don't have police reform and police accountability. Um, there are so many things and, and, and moving to democracy fast forward ahead. Yes, we all can celebrate an amazing Supreme Court justice that we just saw this past week, um, but there are so many the things that need to happen. So what is the message? What is the narrative to those voters in Georgia who may be tired? And we called on them after November 2020 and called on them to, to push us through in November, uh, excuse me, in January of 2021. And then they just had a slew of local and state elections this past November. Those voters in Virginia who have an election cycle year after year, right? Um, and we hear this every election cycle. This is the most important election cycle um, of our lifetime. But what does that mean and how we're telling our story as progressives, how we're telling our story on the wins um, that our communities need to see um, across the board that, connect, that, that connects the dots overall. So understanding that, we, I don't think we can leave that to any one administration. I don't think we can leave that to any one elected official. So how do we connect these dots through coalition building, um, telling the story of the amazing work that has happened since um, January of 2021, um, right? Um, not only at the national level, but also at the um, local level, but then also understanding meeting voters where they are and realizing that some folks may not have seen anything since the last election cycle. So what does that mean in terms of having conversations with those voters directly? Um, so the three things again, is voting rights is a big piece at the federal and the state level. Um, of course, connecting the dots and coalition building and messaging and narrative and telling our story and recognizing and what voters are in the process. Thanks, Dominic. Um, so last, I'm gonna turn it to Charlie and then uh, I'll cycle back through with, uh, with a round of questions. Charlie. Thank y'all so much. And Dominic, if you figure out that message, I, I am tired as hell down here. So would, would, love, would love to know what that message is down in Texas. Uh, but thank y'all so much for having me and for including Texas in this really critical conversation. Uh, my name is Charlie Bonner. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the communications director here at Move Texas and a voting rights advocate in this great state. Uh, Move Texas is a nonpartisan nonprofit focused on building political power for Texas's young people. We focus primarily on voter registration and voter mobilization for young people of color, 18 to across this giant state. Um, and then over the past year, we've become really intimately involved in the fight for the freedom to vote here in Texas, mobilizing hundreds of young people and thousands of folks across the state to the Capitol, to events across the state to speak out against the really scourge of voter suppression that we saw in Texas over the past year um, that made lots of national headlines um, and ate up a lot of my life over the past year. Um, and, but hopefully we also hope that it really spurred a larger national conversation about what voter suppression really looks like in the modern era. Uh, Texas is making the playbook that is being shipped out across the country as it is in Georgia. Um, these two real battlegrounds, the front lines of this fight for the freedom to vote. And what happens in these states is critical for every voter in the country. Um, and so I, I Concerned to tell you about what's happening down here, but I hope that it is uh, raising every red flag possible for folks in every corner of this country, um, because what happens in Texas does not stay in Texas. And so I can speak um, a little bit specifically to what the bill is that we are now focusing on in Texas. Um, Anti-voter Senate Bill 1 was passed last year after four separate special sessions were forced to be called um, to pass that piece of legislation, um, in part because Democrats and the Texas legislature walked out not once but twice um, to make sure that that legislation could not be passed. And in doing so, they were able to limit some of the worst provisions in those bills that would have made it 
easier to overturn the results of an election without ever actually having to prove fraud. Um, it would have limited hours of voting on Sundays, which we saw as a direct attack on Souls to the Polls efforts um, across Texas and some, some of the other different mechanisms within there. Unfortunately, that bill did pass, even though thousands of Texans showed up to speak out in opposition. The vast majority of those who spoke out at the Texas Capitol were in opposition to the bills. Um, and every single time we would have one of those hearings, they would last longer than 24 hours because so many people showed up to give their two minutes of testimony to speak out against that legislation and nothing changed, right? Even when those folks came up, they did not amend those bad parts of the bills out. We had to fight for all of that again and again and again. Um, the most notable provision that I think is really making headlines across the country over the past several months is surrounding vote by mail here. Um, the legislation created new essentially voter ID requirements within vote by mail that you would either have to put the last four of your um, social security number or your Texas driver's license on both the vote by mail application and on the ballot itself, which either number you choose would have to match what you registered to vote with whenever that was. So if you are someone who registered to vote 50 years ago with your driver's license and you put your social security number on this application, that was an automatic rejection of that application despite both of those numbers being correct. Um, and there was no way, of course, to inform those voters that they had made that mistake. They created loopholes within the law that the local elections officials could not communicate with voters about vote by mail. And as a result, we saw north of 20,000 uh, vote by mail ballots rejected just in the past primary election. And we are extraordinarily concerned about what that means for the upcoming governor's race and midterm elections this fall. And so that's one area where we are particularly laser focused. But I think it's important to note also that yes, we have this new law. This law is passed in the backdrop that Texas already has the most restrictive voting laws in the country. And so we are dealing with a wide web of issues in this state right now, um, really affecting every single voter. So thank you for having me today to talk about this. Thank you, Charlie. And thanks to all the panelists for these rich opening remarks. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, kind of cycle back through uh, panelists in reverse order with a, a series of specific questions. And I welcome panel uh, um, uh, members of the audience um, of the JCPA community to drop questions into the chat. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of curate those as we go. Um, you can send them directly to me or put them in uh, chat, everyone. Um, so Charlie, Question for you, how are the restrictions on the freedom to vote in Texas um, impacting other issues that are occurring across the state? Like how is it playing out in, in the context of the rest of the kind of uh, policy debate and legislative agenda in, in Texas? Yeah, well, un unfortunately um, it's affecting everything, right? The, the thing we know foundationally, right, that uh, voter suppression limits the ability for everyday voters to hold their elected representatives accountable. And so it means that we have elected officials across this state up and down the ballot that do not feel as though they are actually accountable to the people who live here. Uh, they are accountable to a very small portion of folks who show up in primary elections on their side. And what we see is a mass radicalization of policy as a result that's completely out of touch where the majority of Texans, the ma mainstream in Texas, Texas is and has been for several years. And so we are now seeing laws passed that were literally laughed out of the legislature two to four years ago. Things like open carry, constitutional carry across the state, the attacks uh, on abortion access in the state, which are disgusting and there are a lot of issues happening with right now, and particularly the attacks we see on trans kids across the state, which are extraordinarily unpopular amongst most folks in Texas. We also see that they choose those issues, our legislators to focus on, instead of trying to fix the electric grid here, which is constantly on the brink of failure. Um, you know, I, I went without power for a week last year uh, when we watched hundreds of folks across the state die because of the inaction of our lawmakers. And it was so dramatic and so severe and so widespread that we thought our lawmakers have to do something about this, right? There's no way we're gonna get caught up in another round of partisan infighting when the issues facing Texans are so severe, they are literally life and death. And I was very unfortunately wrong about that prediction. The partisan politics in this state are stronger than folks' humanity at the moment. And it is a heartbreaking thing to watch in this state that I love so much and have committed my life to bettering. 
happening. Um, and we see this across the state. And, you know, one of the real aims of voter suppression is not just that silencing at the ballot box, right, but the silencing in our hearts, in our minds that our voices don't matter and that we can't do anything to fix this. And, and I think the greatest thing that we are seeing in Texas right now is that feeling um, of powerlessness, that people do not feel like they can do anything to change this in this moment. And it's going to take a lot of collection, collective action, collective organizing to get over that hump. Got it. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're on it, Charlie. Um, I'm going to turn to Dominic next. Uh, Dominic, can you talk a little bit about the implications uh, for the upcoming election of Congress's failure to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the Freedom to Vote Act, which I know all of us were very tuned into earlier this year and, um, you know, feeling the the absence of what are the implications of that going to be for, for the 2022 midterms? Yeah, I think, uh, great question. I think Charlie um, just hit on a piece of it and what he's seen in Texas. And I know Texas at the very first primary uh, for the 2022 election season, and they saw um, some issues there with all the current voting rights um, setbacks that happened in the state legislature, um, as well as Rachel and Elise mentioned it in some of their remarks earlier. Um, but it's going to have a huge implications in terms of what what's able to happen for folks to vote. Um, we do know we're seeing aggressive anti-voting laws across states. Many of these states are states where, again, people of color um, and or folks who will vote um, in progressive ways, for lack of better words, um, in terms of, of, of voting and being involved in the voting cycle. I think with Congress not being able to protect voters, um, it creates scary times as we're thinking as all of the things that we're seeing already at the polls, from voter intimidation to mis and disinformation that is happening um, at the polls. But most importantly, um, when you think about um, in the 2020 election cycle, and we are still somewhat in a pandemic, um, right? And all of the, the safety procedures that were um, protected from many voters, particularly voters in the South. Um, I think about Texas, I think about Georgia, I think about Florida, and, and Charlie, I come out of Florida, so I'm right behind you with the crazy that happened in some of the states. When I think about many of these states where um, we didn't see full um, progress on voting rights, um, but we did see during the pandemic um, when many of the election administrators um, or folks on the ground locally and statewide put provisions in place to make it easy for folks, whether it was extending vote by mail, whether it was allowing folks to feel comfortable and safe at the polls given the pandemic, et cetera. Um, so what does that look like now with these rollbacks in these states and states like Ohio as well? Um, if a measure is passed like in Michigan, which um, the great governor there is pushing back on. Um, and if the measure is passed this November um, on the ballot, um, where folks are going to roll back some of the voting, the voting gains, voting rights gains that we made in Michigan, it is going to really cripple democracy. It's going to cripple voters. Again, oftentimes it cripple voters of color. Um, it crippled working class families, um, oftentimes in terms of moving this country. So it is imperative um, that Congress and real time and make some gains and movement on the John Lewis Voting Rights Act um, and or the Freedom to Vote or the Freedom to Vote Act, um, because we are getting, you know, hammered in state legislatures. And oftentimes in many of these state legislatures um, where we're getting hammered in, we don't have control of the state legislature and or don't have control at the executive office, which then also leads to the next piece around redistricting, right? That's a, a piece that we don't lift up often that connects to voting rights. Um, and so redistricting is a huge piece there. Um, in terms of districts being redrawn and districts being unfairly um, redrawn. And we're seeing that in state after state. And there's plenty of lawsuits that are happening and slowing up the redistricting process. Um, but due to that and not having voter and federal voting rights in the language of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act, there's language that protects fair redistricting from state legislatures or folks on the ground in these states to make ridiculous maps um, that best serves their interests and not the interests of those communities in those areas. So there's a lot of implications that will happen. Now, what I will say on the positive side, all of the organizing that we've seen over the last two years, three years around this, I think we can continue to push and go. And I think folks understand the obstacles in front of us. Um, so we're going to do what we need to do to buckle down and ensure um, that folks get to the ballot the best so that we can get them to the ballot by educating them. I think it's on those issues um, that Charlie just brought up, um, those local issues. <laughs> Issues that are happening in states directly um, overall and what that looks like as well and making sure we're connecting voters and meeting them where they are. Once we meet with those voters where they are, we can really get them to the polls in the right way. But it's continuing to push, push, push. Um, and 
then holding Congress accountable and not passing those federal bills um, back in early January. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dominic. Um, Rachel, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, like as everyone in this in this space knows, the, the Jewish community has uh, like a tragic deal of uh, of experience dealing with anti-Semitic violence. And I'm curious how you would help us expand our toolkit beyond the kind of traditional um, concrete barriers and armed guards that are the things that are sort of go-to um, answers for, for the Jewish community often uh, in ways that could enhance our community's safety and security around political violence, but, but violence in general in more systemic ways. Thanks so much for that question, Aaron. Um, and I think this brings up a really important point, which gets back to that definition of political violence, that it's not just about the physical act of violence. And so while safety, physical safety and security are important, the impact of political violence extends beyond its immediate physical um, implications, its immediate victims. Um, and, and it doesn't come out of nowhere, right? Um, if, if we want to reduce um, the threats to physical safety and security, we need to make this a less permissive environment for political violence overall. And when it comes to that, relationships across different groups is really, really key. Um, building relationship and to that point, coalition, um, you know, part of what this political violence wants to do is send us into our bunkers, right? Distrust is a very powerful tool to erode um, the sort of civic participation, um, civic engagement in a society. And so um, I think we have to um, pay attention to that, the physical safety and security needs, but think beyond just the things that maybe make us feel secure in the moment to ask how can we have an impact on this broader permissive environment. And for that, one of the things that we know um, from research and studies, um, and on my team, we often call this a relational infrastructure to get to that point of, of we have highways, we have infrastructure, we have systems that are set up if we have hurricanes, if we have a tornado, right? Um, for all of these things that are sort of, we know that there's a risk, but we can't plan for exactly when it might happen. Um, we have internationally, we we have, uh, or for public health crisis, right? We need to think about what is the, the infrastructure of relationships of coalition that we have to prevent and respond to political violence. And that means building lines across, uh, building relationships across lines of difference, across key sectors, thinking about who in your state, in your city, in your town, holds influence and sway with different segments of society. Um, and what this, so I'm talking about faith leaders, business leaders, um, local civic associations, community centers, if there's a relevant university, city government, if they're open to it, public health system, like who are the people that have influence and weight in your community? And how can you come together to do things that proactively undermine risks of violence and set a norm, right? Of this is how we treat each other. This is how we participate in elections here. We believe everyone should feel safe coming to the polls. So we are working together to make that happen, right? We think that everyone should have the information they need about the election, about how to vote and what to expect. So we're working with each of us getting this information out to the groups we work with, local media, local reporters, local newsroom editors, the more you can start to engage um, people who sit in really different places and might not otherwise be willing to collaborate and listen to each other. Um, this is often sort of the biggest tent tent issue. That really matters. It matters, um, again, for undermining risk, for creating an environment um, that, that really undermines the narrative or idea that, that violence will be accepted or okay or supported or simply met with no response. It also sets you up for rapid response, right? So that, that response to violence, in addition to immediately ensuring people's physical safety and security, it needs to go beyond, right? It needs to reset norms in the community that we, we don't accept violence, we reject it. It needs to make sure that people don't feel then a sense of chaos and fear more broadly than that immediate event. It needs to support it, so, so that rapid response capability is around supporting whoever has been targeted, showing up, showing up together, and then dominating the narrative that gets told, right? There may have been an instance of violence, but this is who we are. This is how we're showing up. And the last thing I'll say is that there are a lot of different communities that have been targeted. Um, the Jewish community, like you mentioned, Aaron, has been targeted for a very long time with anti-Semitic attacks. We also know, as has been mentioned on this panel, that different communities have been targeted with voter suppression um, and, and um, around political participation, um, different communities of color in particular. So making sure that in whatever coalitions or planning um, that is being built, 
that the different communities and groups that that have those very frontline experiences being targeted with violence, have a seat, have a voice, are being heard and listened to, um, both for that rapid response so that when a community is targeted, you can show up in a way that they want to be supported um, and um, and to, to just really inform um, intervention. The, the very last thing I'll say that I think is really interesting, different communities also have different relationships with law enforcement. So um, what we saw in the 2020 election cycle is if you talk to city governments, they'd say, we have, we're prepared. If there's violence at the polls, we'll send police there. Well, in some communities, that's going to intimidate people more, right? So I think like being able to navigate some of those conversations early on between different groups so everyone can leverage their own connections and places where they can have a conversation on behalf of a broader coalition and um, figure out how to support each other in a way that works for them is really cr critical. Yeah, I think that's great insights, Rachel. I feel like the, 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 there's so many things in what you just said, but the, 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 the essential quality of relationships that exist before right, like pre-existing relationships before things happen, and the fact that local context is so essential to understand and to respond to, and that this is not something like the things you're talking about are not things that have national solutions. Um, Elise, I'm going to turn to you. Um, uh, we in the United States are a, like a dramatic outlier globally in having partisan election officials oversee elections, which like when I think about it, it feels just crazy. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering, like, are there are there steps that we can take systemically to reduce the role of partisans in election administration in this country? Yeah, so this is a question I get a lot working in the cross partisan space. And they're like, OK, so you must be in favor of you know, independence and nonpartisan commissions and, and things like that. And what I will say is, is I think we should definitely explore how we make election administration uh, less partisan moving forward. And but the political reality in American modern life today is that most people are not neutral. Independents are not neutral. And I think it's um, I think a lot of voters identify as neutral. And then once you ask them questions, you find out that they voted for basically one party or the other their whole lives. Um, and, and that's something I just um, like to bring up because I think like our very unique American tradition in this country is co-partisans at the very local level. When you show up on election day and you see um, Sam and Deb running the election together from various parties and counting and looking at ballots together, um, has worked fairly well. There's certain pro certainly problems with voting rights and um, interference by certain poll workers. And there's a lot of evidence of that. But um, for the most part, um, you know, secretaries of state have, you know, while being elected along a partisan basis, you know, has worked and operated like okay in this country. And I think we should explore ways to take some of the partisanship out of it. And most immediately that means like repealing the laws that passed in Georgia and Alabama and other places that make um, election officials um, appointed that allows the state legislature to appoint election officials. Like those people need to be chosen by the voters and not the state legislatures period. Um, but I, I just, I do wanna challenge this idea that like uh, bipartisan commission, I'll pick on my home state of Wisconsin. I saw some folks, I think Sharon in the chat mentioned she's from Wisconsin. Um, you know, they took the, the election administration out of the Secretary of State's office, made a commission. It's also had problems um, and has suffered from partisanship too. Um, so I think we should, um, the state should experiment with this. The states are, as I forgot who said it, maybe John Adams or something, the laboratories of democracy. We should experiment with this at the state level. But in reality, um, no one is truly politically neutral in this country. And we just need to figure out ways to get rid of the bad laws that just passed in the past couple of years, um, but also find a way to um, get back to this kind of co-partisan tradition that has worked fairly well in many places for, for decades in this country. Thanks, Elise. Um, I'm going to pick up on a theme in that question and just pose a question to, to, to the four of you. And then I'll turn to some of the questions that have come in from the audience. Um, audience members, feel free to drop questions in the chat. Panelists, feel free to drop questions in the chat for each other if you've got, if something has piqued your curiosity. Um, uh, but I, uh, this is a question for, for all four of you, and any of you can answer, no, no obligation. Um, as, as with so many other issues in this highly polarized political moment, voting rights, um, nonpartisan election administration, even the peaceful transfer of power, as baffling as that is to me, have become partisan issues. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how to build um, more robust 
transpartisan or bipartisan or pick your you know nonpartisan adjective support for these things that that historically not perfectly but historically have had more robust um, transpartisan support and really feel like the fundamental building blocks of American democracy, right? Like the fair, I, I, a professor at, at uh, Johns Hopkins University, Hari Han, says this amazing thing that a healthy democracy is one in which people um, are willing to sacrifice certainty about outcomes for certainty about process, right? Like I accept that I'm going to lose sometimes because I think the game is fair. And, and I feel like that's that's a that's a, a thing that we've we're, we're at risk of losing. And I'm wondering what what thoughts you have about how we try to rebuild that. I can start. I, there's I think there's no, certainly no, no one easy answer. And as someone who came out of working on international violence prevention, election violence prevention, I mean, this is this this sort of. Um, partisanship around process, right? And and my team wins at all costs is um, par for the course of what we see in in, in places that experience conflict. Um, so I, I think it's going to require a number of different approaches. But just to give a few examples of the types of things that I think matter, um, one is that we need to do um, work within groups. We have seen that um, there is a really harmful incentive structure in certain spaces where people speak out to say, hey, the election wasn't stolen, right? We've seen people, we've seen Liz Cheney get censured, right? For, for accountability for January 6th, right? We've seen things that should absolutely not be partisan, like um, support to find out what happened when we experienced an inter insurrection and hold people accountable become partisan. And it's not just that they've become partisan, right? It's that for people that are credible voices, um, within specific groups and communities, they face costs now for using their voice to speak out. So figuring out how to change that incentive structure is going to be essential. And that means looking at different parts of the system, right? I'm, I'm gonna use that example again. It wasn't only being censored, it was saying, hey, your PR company is not gonna represent you anymore. Your fundraising company is being told it's, it's either you or everyone else. So how do you change that cost structure that's happening for the people that are sort of sticking their necks out and for, for everyone around them? Part of that has to do with building critical mass and a scaffolding of support across different spaces. And part of it has to really, and then again, I take this from other conflict contexts. You wanna actually look at what's the incentive structure? What are the costs that someone's facing? How do you reduce the costs? Um, so there is a level of within group work then that needs to be done um, and, and an amount of changing the incentive structure. Looking at the media environment, um, and I mean social media and mainstream media, um, uh, that has a huge impact on just what people believe and how much of these narratives they buy into. And I would say that that, that involves, um, again, um, looking at who has decision-making power over things like what's in a headline or a news scroll or how are we going to to, to cover things. And so there's a lot of journalism training programs, but I think that there's also work to ask, how do we, how do we address um, uh, some of the problems with our media ecosystem overall? Um, and then I think that there, there's just another path that I wanna talk about really briefly, which is finding those other pillars in society, which are really influential, but, but their partisan identity isn't their primary identity. So finding alternative identities that people can activate through. So again, this is where business, labor, we saw in 2020 that business and labor came together, right? That's a powerful statement because it's unlikely to see those two people speak, those two groups speaking out collectively. Where are these sort of surprise speaker combinations or unusual coalitions? Where are other pillars? veterans groups. I think faith leaders um, fall in this category. Faith leaders, when some, a faith leader speaks up in support of what you're doing, you feel validated from at least a moral level, right? If faith leaders are able to come together at the local or the state level, they can provide also um, a level of support or cover for others who might have a harder time um, um, speaking out or face different incentives. And I think that's a really important moral voice. So I think looking at where there are centers uh, of gravity and, and, and influence and um, moral authority, I'm really activating those, those pillars and really um, helping them connect to each other so, so that you start to sort of shift the momentum is going to be important where people might want to speak out but feel incentives against um, doing so or feel like it's too high cost. You start to build momentum and, and let people join into something greater that's not just defined by partisan identity. I love that idea of, of surprising coalition partners. Um, Elise, and then I'll go to Dominic, and then to Charlie. 
Yeah, um, what I, I love the, the faith leaders, get people who wear a bunch of different hats and, and start by talking about shared values. But I also, as someone who works on domestic democracy issues each day, sometimes it's good to stop talking about democracy and start using other words. Like if you start using the word authoritarianism, I mean, like people can check out, I can check out. I, you know, I hear about this all day and we didn't coin this, but I've heard this kind of like in the movement and like what's happening right now with the, the partisan takeover of elections is it's replacing the refs, right? Refs don't decide the outcome of the game. The players, you know, each team fights their hardest and they shake hands at the end. And we need to start talking about politics, even if it's very oversimplified, you know, and the rules are being changed and all these other things. Um, we're, we're replacing the refs and we actually don't accept that. Like that's not acceptable to us as Americans. Um, and just, just don't talk about the Republican party. Don't talk about the democratic party for a second. Just talk about like basic shared values. And um, again, this theme that you mentioned Aaron at the top, like if democracy is a precondition, what do we agree on? If we agree on that statement um, and, and then go from there. That's great, thanks Elise. Dominic. Yeah, you know, I agree with both uh, Elise and Rachel. It's something that Rachel had, had said a second ago around this accountability piece. Um, I think there's a level of accountability. I think we have to be honest, like what folks are, are tired. I think, uh, Elise, it's what you were just saying, uh, you know, democracy and fights and et cetera. And so I think as folks who are in this work, recognizing that, but then too, every elected official is accountable to someone, right? Um, whether it is number one, um, the folks that put them in the office that voted or did not vote for them. But number two, um, what I saw, I think in Georgia last year, then the voting rights piece, when I saw, uh, Rachel, you mentioned this labor, corporate connection that happened. But when I saw the progressive community really put the corporate um, community on blast around some of the voting, around supporting um, candidates in the state legislature or state legislature in the Georgia legislature uh, for those folks who were supporting voting rights. And so how do we connect the dots between um, our favorite soda pop, Coca-Cola, right? If that's your favorite thing um, or your favorite corporate entity that you purchase and the consumer buy, a voter would buy all the time and connect those dots and hold folks um, accountable. I think the other piece that was mentioned a second ago, it, it really is this, this piece around connecting the dots around coalition building and true alignment, true, I want to say that again, true alignment and figuring out where do we align um, as coalitions, as whether it's labor, the corporate community, the civil rights community, the progressive community, et cetera, finding common uh, common knowledge between the issues that we're aligning on and then building the larger fight around that, right? And so how do we connect those dots? And I think the third piece is for me, it is always local. Uh, we nationalize a lot of stuff. Um, I think Elise was just saying that we, we nationalize it. Um, but the more local that we are, um, the more that we are able to lift up what's happening on the ground, lift up everyday people, everyday stories, um, lifting up how this stuff is really impacting folks' lives. I think it changes the narrative um, in some way. It gives us as organizers or leaders who are leading this work an opportunity to shift the strategy in a different way because we're then now focusing in on the work that is happening in Texas or Florida or Wisconsin, et cetera, uh, and connecting those dots. And I think when people see the dots connected and see accountability with that, I think then we can see a little bit more change and or progress um, towards some of these big democracy buckets that we like to talk about so much. Thanks, Dominic. Um, Charlie, I'm going to go to you, and then I'm going to do two quick speed rounds. So, Charlie, you're up. Perfect, perfect. You know, I think when we're looking at trying to build this kind of cross-partisan support, I think, to me, it comes back to we, we have to find better ways to tell the truth. Right? We have to understand that we are in a landscape in which the majority of Americans across party lines believe voter fraud occurs at much, much higher rates than the reality. Um, and that has become, there is a well-funded media operation to make that an inherent part of everyday American life, right? For decades. This is a lie that has been told over and over and over again to the point that most Americans believe it. And so then when you have a bill that comes forward in Texas, in um places like Georgia and Florida, they can say, well, we're just trying to fix that silly little voter fraud problem that you all already believe in, right? 
And it becomes very simple for folks to just say passively, well, okay, well, how hard is it to get an ID? You know, it becomes easy because that lie is so ingrained. And we do not have a strong enough media infrastructure, communications infrastructure on the progressive side, on the pro voter side to fight these conspiracy theories. If we look, just take this Texas law as one little example, right? We saw 2020 fraught with conspiracy theories about changes in vote by mail, right? When we know vote by mail has been a safe way for folks to vote since literally the Civil War. Like this has never been an issue it was completely falsified, spread on, spread on social media by our elected officials, who then then go to the legislature and say, well, my constituents are very concerned about this lie that I've been telling. We must do something about that, shouldn't we? And they justify their own conspiracy theories with legislation. And then they get into these legislative hearings and have no actual proof to show. They only have their conspiracy theories in the outrage of the people that they have spread lies to. That is the factual basis that they then use as the legislative record to pass these bills, right? So we're in a very vicious cycle here, but there's one that I think we can overcome, but it's going to take building a really dramatic infrastructure to fight election disinformation um, in all of its forms. Great, thanks, Charlie. Okay, so I'm gonna ping off to each of you a question that came in from an audience member for a, like a quick response. And then I've got a last kind of um, a comment that I'd like from a question that I'd like to pose to, to each of you in turn. Um, uh, uh, Dominic, a question came in about what uh, what's a good source of information to help people talk with other people who don't think that the voting bills in Georgia and Texas are actually restrictive of voting rights? Like, how do you navigate that, that challenge? Oh, that is a, a great question. Um, there are a, a few resources that can one, um, can help folks navigate um, how to have those conversations um, on the ground. And I know, Charlie, you may know, clearly know Texas way more um, than I do, uh, but there are statewide nonpartisan um, civic engagement tables um, in states that folks are in where you're able to have, um, we call them the C3 tables, the state voices tables, um, where there is plentiful information and you can actually go to the National State Voices website. Um, there is a voting rights link there um, that literally will take folks um, to a place that you can go state by state, state to see clear messaging and or talking points on voting rights that are happening in real time in those states and how to have that conversation. NEACP is a true supporter of that. Um, if we go to the NEACP site, um, we have lots of information around voting rights and having that. But I think it's honestly having the conversation and people telling their experience and listening to folks' experiences of how the issues they may have had um, on voting before, um, if that makes sense. I see Charlie is putting the Voting Rights Lab um, in the site and the chat as well. So that's another resource that folks can go um, and look at as well. Great, thanks, Dominic. Um, Charlie, quick question for you. What are the, can you, can you say just a, a word more about the legal challenges that are being, uh, the, the restriction, the legal challenges that are being made to the restrictions on absentee and early voting in Texas? Yeah, a lot. A lot. There's a lot of lawsuits in Texas right now around this election. So do, the, do, the, do the brief over. We got, a lot. we got a lot of them going on and several, the vote by mail particularly confusing because there were injunctions ahead of the primary and things like that. Um, I think there was also a bit of the part of the question on um, the election officials, specifically part of that, which is part of what we are challenging in court right now. Part of the law made it where local elections officials and there's some real broad definitions in there that are part of what we are trying to figure out um, that in part does elections officials include people who volunteer to register other people to vote in Texas. Um, you have to be certified by the state to do that. And so there are some legal understandings that like myself as a volunteer deputy registrar could not communicate with a voter about vote by mail in a way that could be seen as soliciting a ballot from them. Um, so we are working on stopping that, but how this played out in the primary was local elections officials were getting old applications for vote by mail. People have them laying around, campaigns have them around, send them out. And so instead of just, send, they couldn't just send you the correct application 
or tell you that you needed to request the correct application from them. So they are getting wrong applications that are no fault of the voter, right? They are getting correct information from that voter and they cannot communicate with them in a way to get, they were trying to figure out how to like convince you to ask them for the real application. That's like what these elections officials were having to do. Mm -hmm. And we heard places like Harris County were running like 24 hour phone lines that they couldn't keep staffed because it was such a horrible experience for the people People on the phone line to try to help navigate these, like vo help voters navigate this in the confines of these laws. They could not keep people staffed to even answer questions for voters because it was so troubling and put everyone in such great legal risk. Um, and so I think as we're looking at this too, and it kind of relates to a couple, how we're talking to folks about voter suppression, to go to that last question, I think so many people have a limited view of what voter suppression is that exists in black and white. And it, it looks like fire hoses and it looks like poll taxes and it looks like these bygone things that we read in textbooks, right? When what we're seeing right now is really ways that we are villainizing those local elections officials. Most of the Texas law does not have to do with an individual voter's experience. It has to do with how that elections official is carrying out that law and how they can communicate with voters. And so now what we see is all these problems about vote by mail. The governor comes and says, well, that's the local elections official's fault, isn't it? And they're, they're the person who actually has to reject those ballots. So they have made like unenforceable laws to further villainize these folks. And I think that's something that we, we haven't gotten into the nuances enough with folks on what voter suppression really looks like in the modern era. Right, great. Thanks, Charlie. Um, okay, so this is our, we're, we're, in our, we're in our last five minutes. Um, and what I would like to ask, and we'll go Elise, Rachel, Charlie, Dominic with this. Um, there are a lot of things that we need Congress to do. There are a lot of things we need state legislatures to do. There are a lot of things we need governors to do and election officials and elected officials to do. But I'm curious, um, the, the, the people in the audience here are, are citizens, right? They are the, the, the building blocks of American democracy. They are citizens and they are members of civil society organizations. Um, uh, JCPA, JCRCs, many civil society organizations. And so my question is, um, and you can take like a minute each on this, it would be great. What are the, what are your, like the best things that citizens and civil society organizations can do to address the, 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 the deep and, and profound challenges that each of you have spoken to? So at least I'll go to you first. Sure. Um, Dominic and others mentioned it. Um, build those coalitions now, that conversation needs to have happen now. And they're really hard conversations when it's at this temperature and where we are right now. Um, you know, I think um, part of that too is just kind of reflecting this moment we're in right now with Ukraine and understanding like we're potentially at this inflection point like in defending liberal democracy around the world. And I think that is a really unifying and like healing thing to start with if people are um, having a hard time jumping right into, you know, this Republican bill passed in this state and Democrats don't like this part. And like that, that's really hard to untangle. Um, so um, building the coalitions now, talking about how this is a defense of liberal democracy, not just in the United States, but around the world. Um, and, and just making sure you know who's on the ballot honestly, this fall and what they stand for. And are they going to accept the results of a free and fair election, no matter what the outcome is, even if their preferred candidate doesn't win? Um, all, all of that starts now and volunteer to be a poll worker. Another plug, um, we need a lot of um, new folks, especially in a pandemic. Um, younger folks are turning out to be uh, poll workers and we they truly are the guardians of democracy. It's a uniquely American tradition to have average people showing up and running our elections um, safely and securely. So I think those are all um, big to do's for, for local civil society orgs. Great, thanks so much, Elise. Rachel. I'll be extra quick because I really agree with all of that. And I would just um, zero in on that, build relationships. And I, I think in particular, because my lens is political violence to really think about it in that more holistic way to ask, who do I need to be in community with and in conversation with now? And that if or when something happens, being able to reach out to those same networks. Um, but but really thinking in that, that holistic frame and asking what can we do together to make this a less permissive environment for violence? What can we do together so that the current climate of intimidation and harassment doesn't mean that our neighbors, our community, 
others don't feel safe coming to vote, right? So I think really looking at, at building those relationships that you might not in other times and having some of these conversations early on to build trust, to know where you can expect disagreement and different approaches. Um, and I would say like to get really concrete, map out your connections, right? Even at like who, who like as a network, who do we have access to, right? I know these leads of local businesses. I know this person who's a journalist and we might be able to do a briefing or get information about the people that are covering so they have accurate information, really getting creative about just like, what is our actual reach and seeing that as a real asset? What are the resources we have collectively to bring to bear? Right. Thanks, Rachel. Charlie? Yeah, definitely agreeing with everyone. I think in part, we have to largely shift our understanding of our roles, all of us, right? It is no longer enough to just be a voter right? We have to become the trusted sources on elections that we wish our elected officials were going to be, and they are actively failing us, right? We have to make sure that our friends and neighbors know how to navigate these new voter suppression laws and can cast a ballot that counts. That's on all of us now. As people who show up, as people who can understand the nuances of these issues, we have to take that on for ourselves now. Um, and I think that's the conversation we're having with young folks across the state of Texas right now is how do we train a generation of young people to be those in ambassadors for their friends and their families and make sure that everybody in Texas can cast a ballot that counts. Great. Thanks, Charlie. Dominic, last word to you. Yep. I'll be quick. I agree with everyone. I think it's build, build, build relationships. And most importantly, I think folks, um, this is going to be so cliche for NACB, but volunteer engagement, volunteer, get involved and get engaged with organizations that align with you because the folks that are part of those organizations, you help shift how organizations think and approach the work because of your involvement and engagement. And the relationships work much better at the ground level, the local and the state level, than they do nationally because we know our communities better than anyone else, what's needed, what's not happening and what that looks like. So everything that everyone said, coalition building, um, but get involved get involved, get engaged. I know we're tired. Uh, I, I know everyone is tired, um, but there's so much ahead. There's so much work. Um, and we, if we were not doing such a great thing, folks will not be attacking um, the great things that we're trying to push to, to build a more inclusive democracy overall. So that's all I will leave us with. Thank you. Um, Charlie, Dominic, Rachel, Elise, thank you so much. Uh, JCPA, thank you for bringing us together. Um, I'm, I'm already uh, putting in a note to JCPA to request a reunion of this uh, this quartet for spring of 2024 so we can do this again, but I want 90 minutes next time. Uh, and I hope uh, all of the folks in the audience uh, really valued this um, uh, this conversation and uh, really tremendous, tremendous gratitude to our panelists. Thanks, everybody.